This is really supposed to be based on fluorescence surgery of fluorescein versus 5-ALA. But I'm going to take this opportunity to actually frame the, try to frame the discussion a little bit because fluorescence and you know fluorescein and 5-ALA are just they're simply tools. They're surgical tools that we can use to maximize extended resection. But it does warrant a good discussion about what are our surgical goals. What are we trying to accomplish in surgery? Um, because I'm trying to make some arguments here that show that that goal may have changed over the last several years. So, you know. Many of us in the room, many people in the room, have really outlined the importance of extended resection, even describing thresholds. And we use these sort of thresholds combined with expected neurological outcome, combined with our understanding of neuroscience, to try to figure out and balance putting the patient through risk of additional cytoreduction surgery. And I put up here the classification system that, as we all know, in WHO 2016, kind of changed those definitions, right? Not all glioblastoma are the same. And so are our goals the same for each patient? So when we're talking about each individual patient and counseling patients prior to surgery, as we discussed, each of us, when we look at any of these films, we start to weigh what the tumor volume is and location and their performance status, comorbidities, social support. And we just go down a list of in our minds of what we think the patient would benefit from. And we should have a little evidence behind um, what we're doing. So let's talk about that a little bit. So uh, before we talk about fluorescent surgery. So I really wanted to show here, you know, some of the data that we've recently analyzed, unpublished, where we look at some of the uh, iterative effects um, and the interaction between volumetric extended resection and molecular markers and clinical factors um, that give us a bit of a roadmap with respect to what, we're, what we should be trying to accomplish in surgery. So previous studies really haven't focused in a comprehensive way on resection combined with molecular markers and patient characteristics and plus or minus chemo radiation because we didn't really, these studies came out pretty much before we had a better definition um, of molecular subclassification of tumors. So to do this, we basically looked at 20 years of history in UCSF data set. Um, you had to have your index surgery at UCSF, and that gave, left us at about 850 glioblastoma patients, newly diagnosed glioblastoma patients. And then we do the typical look at tumor, uh, look at their pre-op and post-operative volume, and not just enhancing, but non-enhancing tumor volume and extensive resection. And then we have to break that down into the post dupe era looking at really roughly 700 patients since 2005 because we know the chemotherapy reg uh, regimen vary a bit with these patients. And then we can basically take these populations and look uh, based on IDH status, MGMT status, contrast and non-contrast enhancing tumor, age, whatever demographic we want. And we'll kind of break this up into three, subs, three subsets of tumors, uh, three subsets of patients. This is not right. Our, our pointer. So we'll focus on the um, entire cohort, the stoop era. Um, we'll remove the good actors, IDH mutant patients, and focus on IDH wild type, and then focus on MGMT status. So if we take all patients together and just look at a volumetric extended resection as it relates to your log hazard ratio for glioblastoma morbidity, you, or mortality, I should say, you really get a chart similar, a graph similar to what we know, right? We know here that um, as you achieve roughly 80% extended resection, your risk, your mortality risk goes down. And you can also see here that the, it's a relatively flat plateau between 40 and 80% extended resection. And we've known that. This isn't anything new. But if we use a recursive partitioning um, statistical method, really, of multi, uh, really a, a, just a different way of doing a multivariate analysis to try to create a decision tree um, based on an independent variables, and then we can look at the interplay and the interaction between these variables to try to understand what's important with respect to our patients um, from a surgical standpoint. So let's focus on the post-stoop era. I'm going to try to break this down, but we, if you look at our post-stoop patients, our stoop era patients, focusing on IDH mutation, you see a couple of levels in this tree here that are generated. Presence or absence of temozolomide, IDH status, age, 
contrasting and non-enhancing and non-contrast contrast enhancing tumor volume. And we can plot out survival curves. And let's march down each of these curves. So as you would expect, the poorest performing patients, the worst actors are those who had no temozolomide and age greater than 65. And conversely, our best performing patients were those with uh, IDH, um, IDH uh, uh, mutated and had greater extended resection of the non-enhancing tumor volume if they were under the age of 65. And then if we throw some intermediate patients in there, our third group, our third partition, now we have patients who still had no temozolomide, but they were under the age of 65. And they tend to co-cluster with those over the age of 65, regardless of their, tem of their contrast enhancing tumor volume. And then we can throw a fourth group in there. Um, our fourth level, again, is our, our IDH wild type patients who uh, had basically a uh, under the age of 65 with greater non-enhancing tumor, um, uh, uh, a non-enhancing tumor residual, and we can kind of simplify this curve a little bit, um, and I'll show you another another way of looking at this. And this is going to be the key to the latter half of this talk. So if we focus on call on Figure C here where we basically take our two blue, can you see my marker? Yeah, where we basically take our two blue groups, right? These are our best performing patients, our IDH mutant individuals, and we separate those out because there are two populations that cluster together. You can clearly see here that if we look at our dark blue, those are our, this is, these are our IDH, our temozolomide positive IDH mutant patients. But then you have our IDH wild type patients under the age of 65 with a greater extended resection of the non-enhancing tumor volume. And the shocking part here to me when I first saw this is that look at these patients tend to cluster together with our IDH mutant patients for the, roughly the first three years with greater extended resection of the non-enhancing margin which is going to be important of the non-enhancing tumor, which is, which is going to be important later on as we talk about these adjuvants and these tools. So again, there are other ways of doing this. We can kick out the IDH um, mutant patients, the good performing, the best performing, and purely look at our IDH wild type, which in this population were 89% of the patients. And we get five points in our decision tree, five partitions. And again, we're clustering based on contrast enhancing tumor. If you did not receive temozolomide, if you do receive temozolomide, age greater than age, greater than or less than 65, our patients under the age of 65 do better, and the extent of resection tends to depend on the enhancing tumor resect, non-enhancing tumor resection, not the enhancing tumor. Where for under the age of 65, our RPA really focused on contrast enhancing tumor margin. Um, I won't take you through this again. The point of this isn't really to talk about this paper, um, but it, it makes me think about what are our goals in surgery, right? So again, the, in the post stoop population, we know that temozolomide treated patients that are IDH wild type and over the age of 65 really clearly benefit from extended resection of the enhancing tumor. But our IDH wild type temozolomide treated patients under 65 benefited from resection of both non-enhancing and enhancing tumor with a median extent of uh, median uh, survival similar, at least for the first three years uh, that we had in the study. And those patients doing worse were those who did not receive tilenzolamide over the age of 65. Um, so again, this was a, really the first study we, uh, that we've, we've known about to combine extended resection with enhancing and non-enhancing tumor combined with molecular and clinical information in a large single institution longitudinal manner. But it, I, I wanted to put that as a precursor to talking about these surgical tools because, because really what are, what are our goals? What are we trying to accomplish here? And so with that, let's talk about some of our options. And these are all proxy for cellularity. We heard a great talk about Raman spectrum microscopy. You can go with confocal microscopy. You take your pick. But these labeling systems are really just proxy for cellularity. So if you look at 5-ALA or 5-aminolevulinic acid, uh, which is now FDA approved for use here in the United States, um, it, allow, it basically allows for a, a better visualization of the tumor margins. So it's a naturally occurring biological precursor to hemoglobin. And when it accumulates in significant levels in the cells, um, it gives off a fluorescence uh, that can be visualized with the right type of microscope. Um, and so these are basically in malignant glioma cells and epithelial, it's converted into a fluorescing porf uh, uh, porphyrin. 
And so there have been a number of ways of studying this. Um, the classic gliolan is given at a dose that's about 20 milligrams per kilogram. It's administered orally three hours prior to surgery. Because of the um, uh, mechanism of action, there are some phototoxicity concerns. So you really shouldn't give it combined with many phototoxic drugs, St. John's wort, um, uh, thiazide, uh, diuretics, sulfurea. Um, there are a couple of other medications where you really should hold these drugs uh, these drugs bef before you, re you give ALA. But in a large study by Stumer et al. in 2006, they basically showed that volumetric extended resection, um, gross total resection specifically, is better in the 5 ALA group in the fluorescence group, 65% in the ALA group compared to 36% in the white light group, um, and six-month progression-free survival was better in the ALA compared to the white light group. So an improved extended resection, I didn't put in here. Here, um, but they actually showed that there was no change in perioperative morbidity in their in their uh, clinical trial as well. And so, mechanism here, as we know, you give exogenous ALA. It's, uh, it's uptake uh, specifically in specific glial cells as well as epithelia and the dura sometimes as well. Converted into portoporphyrin nine, which accumulates in the cell and given it the uh, correct the uh, correct filter, a BLU 400 filter, you can visualize it and visualize it in the operating room. So um, this has been studied in a number of different ways, and I'll say Georg uh, Wilhelm and some others have really tried to explore the utility, uh, everything from giving ALA to non-enhancing tumors to try to find the hot spot, the area of the tumor that may be the most metabolically active and characteristic for a glioblastoma to make sure the pathologists have that tissue. That's been done. Um, at UCSF, we wanted to understand uh, one aspect of it, and that was particularly the, the, any correlation between degree of fluorescence um, and tumor cellularity. So we wanted to know, really, is it a linear fashion? Is the brighter image, the more cellular? Um, and what does that mean? So to do that, we had a uh, single center, open label, phase two trial. We've simply, since closed it down, actually, just about th uh, six months ago now. Um, 300 patients with KPS all over 60. 18 to 72 years of age. What I'm putting caveat here, grade twos and threes, but half, nearly half of these were recurrent glioblastoma as well, or recurrent high-grade glioma. And again, the question here of our study was, does ALA fluorescence intensity correspond with tumor cellularity? And that was really the goal. One important caveat to the study is that um, for our study, we actually gave ALA as an outpatient in an unsupervised manner, which is different um, than the way it's FDA approved here and a part that should be just discussed a little bit. I'm not sure if you guys use ALA here. Are you using it here at your institution? Um, it's really FDA approved for inpatient use, uh, which is really a problem for first start cases um, because it's, you know, unless you can open up your PACU, you know, at four in the morning, it's not adequate amount of time, which <laughs> I don't know many nurses that are going to be okay with that. Um, but that's been a, a, one of the challenges that we'll talk about. But either way, administer the drug three hours before. Um, a, and um, patients didn't come to PACU. Our phase two trial was over a median follow-up of 42 months, and we had to employ um, neuropathology to help us because the goal here was to come up with a grading system, and we used a, a cellularity grading system. Joanna Phillips from a BTRC uh, neuropathology core, she basically gave us um, a grading system, and we used that from the you know, uh, densely cellular, highly cellular with abundant tumor cells to um, no definitive tumor cells present. And we used an odd model basically for imaging fluorescence, for intensity and fluorescence. And we just used basically the surgeon's subjective uh, um, impression of fluorescence. We really wanted to know in real time, kind of uh, uh, in a clinical setting, what the practitioner in the operating room would grade as fluorescence. So you had two people in the operating room, typically either two attending surgeons or a surgeon attending in resident, to just grade fluorescence and agree on a degree of fluorescence here. And you can see the cohort in our biopsies, majority Majority were left-sided, half were current. Majority were glioblastoma, very few complications for ALA, which have been described a number of different ways. And here's the, the distribution um, of, um, of histopathologies. A few grade threes were in there. And so if we start talking about positive and negative predictive value, meaning positive predictive value, percentages of all biopsies taken from the most avidly enhancing or fluorescing tissues, um, which we call an ALA group three that actually have tumor in them, it's pretty good, 97%. So it's a good test um, to determine the presence of tumor cells. 
In terms of negative predictors, um, percentage of biopsies taken from non-fluorescing tissues, or ALA0, with no tumor, not as good, right? 37%. So relatively poor test um, for the presence of, or for the absence of tumor cells. Um, keep in mind that's worse for our recurrent tumors um, uh, than uh, for our newly diagnosed. But if you look at your fluorescence cellularity mismatch or matching, you can pretty much tell with high fluorescence, you're going to have tumor. So an intensity three and a grade three on cellularity pretty much matches up well with a very good correlation. But for absence of fluorescence in tumors, so what I'm meaning there are biopsy uh, situations where there's no tumor cells but demonstrate ALA fluorescence or no fluorescence but have tumor, you can see that 35% still had fluorescence and 63% still had tumor. So, you know, if there's no tumor, why was there fluorescence? Well, you can see that many of these biopsies with fluorescence uh, but no tumor weren't normal tissues. They were reactive. It was mostly necrosis. So it goes to a point of 5-ALA that radiation necrosis can still fluoresce. They have fluorescence in some situations. So um, it's uh, not perfect, but it does give you a pretty good idea. So for ALA, it's a pretty good marker for the presence of tumor, especially when it's the brightest fluorescence. Um, but not as good an indicator for the absence of tumor. And we know that, right? We know that, that the non-enhancing tumor margin still contains tumor. So um, utilizing ALA basically to guide high-grade glioma surgery is safe um, and used many different places. We use it at our place at UCSF um, with uh, great reliability, and it's very safe. So let's switch colors for a moment to sodium fluorescein. So this is... Uh, you know, less used, less often used. We don't use it as much at UCSF, but it is easier in some in some situations. So sodium fluorescein is basically an alternative to 5-ALA. You still typically need to use a fluorescence um, uh, filter for your standard microscope. Um, you give it basically at 5 to 10 milligrams per kilogram, and you give it IV, and you give it after induction of anesthesia, so it's pretty much immediate. And it works because of, an intav of a lack of an intact blood-brain barrier. So the importance there is that if you have a contusion on the cortex or anything um, that, that um, disrupts your blood-brain barrier, it's going to be yellow or whatever color you, you, you choose for your, for your fluorescence. Um, there's a, there was a neat study that actually published uh, several months ago, the uh, fluoroglio study, which basically studied um, in a, published in clinical cancer research that I think is worth going through here. They recruited um, patients, again, with newly diagnosed GBM. It's a smaller study, but, but their goal was to recruit patients where they felt that gross total resection was achievable. So no multifocal disease, nothing crossing the midline, only enhancing tumors um, with a KP required to have a KPS greater than 60. And they used actually a couple of different methodologies in their study, interestingly. They used, for the first half of the cohort, they used a um, the standard 5-ALA filter, which is a blue 400 filter, and then they switched to the 560 filter. Um, the 560 yellow filter is actually a better filter, more sensitive um, for fluorescein. And so you can actually use a lower dose. So they switched their dose midway through the study as well, but it worked um, for them. And again, this is their... These are their screen patients. They had a total at the end of it, all of their exclusions of 46 patients. It was relatively safe, meaning um, they didn't have any adverse events um, or if difficulties with um, um, you know poor neurological outcome. But if you look at the sensitivity and specificity uh, of identifying fluorescein at the at the grossly identified tumor margin, you can see their sensitivity for detecting disease was really only 80.7%, meaning um, for their highly fluorescein positive that actually have high-grade glioma cells was at 80%, and their fluorescein negative, or they're just completely non-fluorescing tissue that did not have high-grade glioma cells was really only 79%. So, you know, again, that gives you a positive and negative predictive value that's not very good. That's not as good as ALA either for identifying that non-enhancing tumor margin. But it gets to the point of what we're trying to accomplish, right? Um, for certain patients, we may not be looking specifically for that non-contrast enhancing tumor margin. The... Um, they made a nice point in their study of basically showing that their their neurologic outcomes weren't any worse. They looked at their they basically looked at the uh, NIH uh, stroke scale, 
uh, which were similar between groups. And you, then you can look at your um, median extended resection for their study, which was an extended resection of 100%. And again, this is uh, they, most of these patients received the uh, at least part of STOOP, um, even though some had to only receive half of the chemotherapy that would have been in a six-month period. One dropped out because of hydrocephalus, and there were 9% um, that received no treatment because of clinical deterioration that they didn't otherwise identify. Their progression, oops, their um, six-month progression-free survival was 56%. Now, again, you have to take caution here. I compare, you can't compare trials uh, for the ALA, uh, the Lancet Oncology study, that was 41% for ALA and 21% uh, uh, for white light. Um, Again, there was a completely different inclusion criteria. This study was looking for specifically enrolling patients where they felt they could achieve a gross total resection, and their 12-month progression-free survival was 15.2%. But here's a comparison between the two technologies. Again, they're both um, very reasonable. They have different benefits. Um, 5-ALA is a three-hour um, three hour administration given orally prior to general anesthesia, given before the patient comes to the operating room. Uh, in the United States as, as well as in Europe. It's given in a supervised fashion in the hospital. Um, so it can pose some logistical problems with patients. Uh, the uh, positive and negative predictive value you can see there. Again, the five uh, sodium fluorescein is given on induction of anesthesia, so you don't have to get the patient in the operating room early. It does rely on a leaky blood-brain barrier. And again, the positive and negative predictive values you can see there. But as I've been kind of mentioning, I guess it really just is a matter of what are our goals in surgery. So if we have this patient that comes in, you know, with a left-sided uh, dominant hemisphere or a right-handed person, so a left temporal tumor, um, are we, is our goal to remove the contrast-enhancing tumor in them or to try to remove as much of the flare as possible and use techni techniques to try to maximize extended resection? Um, uh, without limiting morbidity. And how would that change for a 39-year-old, maybe left-handed patient? Um, I would argue, based on some of the data that we have coming out, that our goals should probably be different for these two patients um, if we have the proper techniques and, and uh, opportunity to map them appropriately. So again, as, as savvy and helpful as 5-ALA and these fluorescent dyes can be, I'm not so convinced that the contrast-enhancing margin as identified by these labels um, is always the extent that we're looking for. There may be situations in which these the negative margins are helpful um, if we think it offers a survival benefit. So I know this is, um, tried to keep it short because I knew we were at the end of the day <laughs> and leave, open, leave it open for questions. But um, there's obviously a lot of people, the 20-year glioblastoma um, survival study that I share with you is a, a work of an enormous number of people. Um, and that's under review right now. But I think it's changing. It's changing a bit of the way that we think about newly diagnosed glioblastoma and how we counsel our patients about our goals of surgery. So thank you. Um, so I'll, I'll kick things off a little bit. And, you know, I, one of the thoughts I had when I read your, your study comparing the, how intense the fluorescence was with the cellularity is, is this an opportunity to uh, either recreate or adapt some of the technology that we see in the vascular fluorescence packages, mm -hmm. right? And it's kind of the same evolution. Initially, we had icy green, and it was in black and white, mm -hmm. and it was purely subjective interpretation, right? And now, two generations later, we have live color overlays with computational qualitative flow analysis. And so is this an opportunity to start doing quantitative analysis with some adapting some existing technology and do you think that that might improve some of the sensitivity and specificity calculations that, and results that you saw? Yeah, so that's a great question. I, you know, I, I really think it depends upon your surgical goal. So um, I will say that for certain patients and tumors in certain locations, my goal is not the contrast-enhancing margin. I don't think a girl's total resection of the contrast-enhancing tumor is adequate. So I would say, um, sure, you can improve your, your sensitivity and specificity of ALA, but it's not going to be enough because we know we can't visualize once we get out of the outside of the bulk area of tumor. Um, 
if, uh, if we're talking about a 70 year old where you're, you know, with a right frontal tumor and you want to just remove the contrast enhancing tumor, I think that's certainly reasonable. And then we've actually toyed with that a number of different ways of uh, better mechanisms to, to quantify fluorescence. And you can do that. Um, in real time, they're not as helpful <laughs> as you think they would be. You know, I'm also curious as to your and Dan and Rob's experience um, with fluorescein. My experience, it's been very disappointing to me as an agent to guide resection because uh, I feel like there's about a 10 minute window where you get a very accurate picture. Uh, and then it tends to seep into the tissues. And for me, the issue is not so much the blood pooling as it is the seepage into traumatized tissue at the border. And so I clear an area, I think it's clear, I put a patty down, come back to look at it later, and there's now fluorescein enhancement there where there wasn't before. Yeah. Um, and I'm curious if that's an issue, if you get any seepage into the traumatized issues with ALA um, versus fluorescein. Yeah, I, I can speak to that a bit. And so ALA is pretty, as a relatively sharp margin. Um, the challenge with ALA is actually the direction of your light. You want to make sure your 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 tangential and your perpendicular, your cone of light is perpendicular, and then you get pretty good, nice, clear margins. But fluorescein is a mess, just like you mentioned. It's um, any tissue in which the blood-brain barrier is disrupted is going to, and that, that, that includes the cortical surface. If you're drilling and um, you know one of your burr holes is a little aggressive on the dura, you're going to have you know fluorescein fluorescein coming through there as well. Be curious to hear what everyone else thinks. Rob, any thoughts on that? Yeah, we don't have uh, we don't have ALA. We haven't started using it yet. Uh, but uh, with fluorescein, uh, yeah, what you uh, I take into account what you said about the tissue seepage. So I try to pick what I would think is the most critical border of the tumor to, re mm -hmm. to resect aggressively first and put those patties down because I know that it's going to seep in you know 20 minutes later when I go back to it. But if I've got those patties there and there wasn't fluorescence at the time when I first opened the dura, then I, I, I consider that as a good marker. Like for example, if I'm at the back of the frontal lobe, I want to do the posterior border of the tumor first, kind of mark that off, and then anteriorly, you know, if it's right frontal lobe, I got I got some margin I can go anyways, whether it's fluorescing or not. You know, if you're if you're going for the non-contrast enhancing rim. That's kind of the way I do it. Dan, are you guys using any fluorescent agents right now in Michigan? So um, um, Sean knows this well, but um, it, it's been you know really hard to wait for these things to um, come to fruition. Walter Schumer, the pioneer of 5ALA, was is actually a, a Michigan guy. He, he trained in Michigan um, a long time back, more for research than clinical, but. Um, you know, so it's been a, we have a long history of, of trying to get this stuff, and we just have gotten it. Um, and we we never did much with the um, uh, fluorescein, uh, but 5ALA I think is transformational. I mean, I'm I'm like definitely a captive audience, but but like along the lines of of what I was mentioning in my talk, being able to see tumor with 5ALA that we didn't see in the past. Um, that alone is is like a, a of, of great benefit, I think. I mean, I'm, I'm taking out more tissue than I would have, um, and it gives me the confidence to go a little further. That said, I, I think Sean's data is, is unbelievable in that we know that there's so much more to the story, and so there's another level that we can achieve with, with other technology, um, and I think taking a systematic approach to understanding what those endpoints are based on data is, is the way to go. <laughs> 